I'll tell you what, we need to stay on fire for God. We need to stay on fire for God all the time. So welcome to the School of Ministry. And, and those of you watching on TV in different parts, on different uh, devices, and on the internet, and through DVD, and listening on CD, and those of you that are here at the School of Ministry, the harvest is plentiful, the labors are few, so I um, want to stir you up. I want to stir you up, because the Bible says that the fivefold ministry gifts, which you learned in one of the sessions, which uh, is the... Um, people that God has placed in the body of Christ. He ascended on high and he gave gifts to the church. What? What did he give those gifts to the church? You'll find that in Ephesians chapter 411. He gave gifts to the church that are offices to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And I shared with the students on our very first session that thank God he gave five different offices. Because if he'd only given one office, it wouldn't be right because that one person could get lifted in pride and say, I do it all. Look at me. But he divided it up to five different offices. And all five of these offices are to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And I'm just going to share this. I believe with all my heart, I'm sure Pastor Yeager and any ministers here are going to believe this when I say it. And you're all going to go, hallelujah, yes, right on, Sister Joan. When we get the whole body of Christ all functioning in the gifts that they have and the callings they have, and we teach them because the five-fold ministry gifts are to teach the saints to do the work, that's no excuse for you not doing the work. That means we need to do the work of evangelism. We need to do the work of discipling. We need to do the work and along with equipping the saints to do the work. And if every single person is operating in their gift and their calling, this would have been wrapped up a long time ago. Yeah. Do you all follow what I'm saying? The churches would have, you know, instead of us trying to fight, fight back Satan and take back territory, you see, we should have been out there taking the territory before the devil got to it. Now we're trying to fix up masses because we've let the devil come in and take our cities and take our towns and take our young and take our elderly people and mess up marriages. So all along, we, according to the book of Acts, when they got saved, they got on fire, and then all of a sudden, all the different ministry gifts started happening. Some were doing food, some were doing this, some were doing that, some were discipling, others were fasting and praying, but it all came together to exalt God. So if we only have, it's like a car. I don't know too much about cars, so let me, you know, see if I put my foot in my mouth here. A car, car I hope they still have them. I don't know, they do so much to cars. But anyway, old cars used to have pistons. Do they still have pistons in cars? Okay. And, and you have more than one piston, right? Don't have you don't have carburetors now. Okay. So it has to go. Because <coughs> I do understand that helps you breathe. But anyway, so we have pistons. Okay. And how many of you know we have spark plugs? See, I don't know about cars. But if you're missing one spark plug, your car is going to go spitter, spatter, spitter, spatter, or maybe not even work. If your engine is just running on one piston, it's doing too much work, and eventually, you follow? So what I'm saying is, a car needs to have all its parts working to have that engine run smooth. Well, if we haven't equipped and trained the body of Christ to find their ministry gifts, then we're operating limply. You all follow me? We're sp sputtering down the road. We're sputtering to take our city. But when the whole body finds their place, their calling, their anointing, and all of us get on fire, you know what the Bible says? Out of our innermost being comes rivers of living water. Is that not true? Out of our innermost beings comes rivers of living water. Well, I tell people all the time, if you have rivers in there, let's not have it be drip, 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 Drip. It's going to take a whole long time to water the lawn if it's just drip, drip, drip. And if your water's not even on, guess what you have to do? Every now and then, you need to prime the pump. They used to have old pumps. And you have to put water down in the pump and push really hard to get it going again. And once you got it going again, the water started splashing out. So we need to prime the pump. So if you have gotten a little lethargy or 
better words, lazy about being a minister and get complacent like the five foolish virgins and the five wise virgins, it says they all slept and slumbered. Like, oh, what are you waiting for? The end of the world? When are we going to get into the vineyard? When are we going to see people saved? When are you going to reach out and fulfill your destiny? You don't want to stand before God and say, he says, oh, oh, let me share this with you. One time the Lord had a spanking for Joan Pierce. Spank me. And nobody else has ever been spanked but me, but it's okay, I'm sure. And he said, um, which video do you want to watch? That's back when we had videos. You know, if he was talking to me now, he would have said, which DVD do you want to watch? But back then it was videos. He said, which video do you want to watch? And I said, well, what do you mean, God? He said, you want to watch the video that you're doing? Or do you want to watch the video that I have planned for you? You follow what I'm saying? God has a plan for you, and we've been teaching in the school of ministry that God has the good, the perfect, and the, the, ex, the acceptable, but the perfect will of God, as it says. He wants us to be in the perfect will of God. Now, the video that he showed me, what I was doing, was okay. It was fruitful. But when he showed me the video of what he wanted me to be, compared to this video, I went, whoa. And he says, so how are you going to get from this video to this video? You see, because this one is way more powerful, more souls, great things. I mean, I saw like whole coliseums worth of people. I mean, I saw coliseums full of people. And I remember being on a platform, and I remember pointing up and saying somebody has this and somebody has that and somebody has this and somebody has that. And, I, and you'd hear whole groups of this place just screaming, screaming and screaming and then coming down and sharing testimonies. And I went, well, well, Lord, that's not happening on this video. He said, but this is what your purpose and destiny is. So how do I get from here to here? And we've been teaching in the school of ministry. It's crucify the flesh. Deal with the issues of life. And all the things that I've been teaching you from series to series to series is what will help you to get to the divine plan that God has for you. Because it's not easy, but God has a divine plan for each of you. And it's okay that you're doing good, but you can be doing his perfect will. And that's what God wants of us. So turn with me in your Bibles to Timothy. Timothy, 2 Timothy, I'm sorry. 2 Timothy, turn with me to 2 Timothy. What does God want of all of us? We've been learning on the School of Ministry. You've been watching, and it's an eight-tape series, and we're on the final series of the, of the tapes. So go with me to 2 Timothy, chapter 1. Young Paul was being tutored. I mean, young uh, Timothy was being tutored by Paul. He was being tutored by Paul, just like the, uh, the, the word equipped the saints to do the work of the ministry. And so... Uh, Paul is writing a letter to Timothy to keep in touch with his young minister, okay? And that's where we're at. And it says in verse 6, 2 Timothy 1, 6. He's saying this to young Paul. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gifts, the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and the sound mind. Now I'm going to stop there for a while. It says in verse 6, stir up. Are you hearing me? It says in verse 6, stir up the gift of God that is in you through the laying on of my hands. Do you follow what I'm saying? That's what young Paul is saying to Timothy. And I'm saying this to all of you students that are here and even ministers that are here and ministers that are watching. It doesn't matter how long you've been in ministry. Are you hearing me? It doesn't matter how long you've been in ministry. There are going to be times in your ministry that you are going to feel a little down. There are going to be times in your ministry where you don't want to push. Okay? There's going to be times. And in those times, there's not going to be anybody. Let me tell you. There are times when you're going through troubled times that there's not going to be anyone on the phone saying, Oh, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. There won't be anyone to encourage you. 
So that that times you have to remember those times that you've been in anointed services and when you've been uh, laid out under the power of God and in the presence of God and maybe you've had prophetic words. In those times, you're going to have to remember how God used you here and God used you here. And you're going to have to get and stir yourself up because there's nobody else to stir you and encourage you to go on. So you have to become warriors. Yeah. Because sometimes you're going to be in the trenches and there's not going to be anybody there but you and God. And you're going to have to trust God and lean not to your own understanding. And in all your ways, you know that he will be there for you and stir up. And it goes on and says, because God has not given you the spirit of fear, but he has given you power and love and a sound mind. He's saying, you know what? You walk in love, young Timothy. You keep walking in love. No matter what you have to go through, just keep stirring up the gifts in you and keep walking in love. You have to remember that to stir up these gifts in you because you're not home yet. And as long as you're here on planet Earth, there is going to be opposition. And if you're going into ministry, you're going to need to know, and you might want to go back to the first tape in this series. The very first tape in this series was the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I shared that you would have sometimes ugly people do bad things to you, and you have to not let that take you out. You need to forgive and forget and go forward and keep going forward and keep going forward. There's no such thing as reverse. You put your hand to the plow, and you don't look back. And it might get hard sometimes, and you might come up against the boulder, and you might have to kind of rock at that boulder for a long time, and it feels like a year's gone by. I'll never forget, I went through some kind of real bad trauma in my life, and I don't need to go into it, but I went through a terrible trauma in my life, and for one solid year, I never felt the presence of God. One solid year, not once did I feel the presence of God. And yet I was preaching almost every night, every night, every night. And I'd pray in tongues for five hours every day. And I fasted two, three times a week. And I was reading my Bible and never felt God's presence for one solid year. But I knew that I don't go by feelings. Amen. I am a woman of faith. Yes. You need to be people of faith. And so I knew that it doesn't go by what I feel. And I definitely knew that it wasn't by what I feel because in the services, when I got to praying for people, the Spirit of God was like off the charts. And I, I, and I would get through praying for lines and lines of people and doing extended meetings. And, and I would just go and sit back in my room and not feel nothing and go, I'm in awe of you, God. I'm in awe of all the people that got saved tonight, how many got filled with the Holy Spirit, and how many miraculous miracles. I'm in awe that you use a broken vessel. And in spite of me being broken, totally to the point of not feeling anything, because whatever I was going through made me totally numb for one year. But God showed up, always showed up. So you have to remember there's going to be times that you have to stir up the gifts in you. And even when you stir them up, you're not going to feel anything. But that's no excuse to back off. You keep going forward. And you keep going forward. And you keep remembering this. God filled me with love. No fear is in me. I walk by faith. I don't walk by what I see. I don't walk by what I feel. I don't walk and I don't gear everything by emotions. I, I base everything on what does the word of God say? What does the word of God say? And you keep doing the word of God, and you keep doing the word of God. So it says here, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in, in you through this laying on of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear. Fear is of the devil. But what we have is power. God empowered us on the day of Pentecost, and he said, all power and all authority I give to you. And when you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you were empowered, power that can change cities. One person can change a city. Look at Peter. One anointed Peter preached one anointed servant, servant, sermon. One Peter, one sermon. 3,000 people except Jesus. Peter and John, two anointed ministers of God, 
Preach again, and because of a miracle, 5,000 more. Don't tell me you can't take the city. If no one else wants to, you can be the next Catherine Kuhlman. You can be the next Wigglesworth. You can be the next John G. Lake. You can be the next Maria Wood Eddard. You can be a mighty, mighty man or woman of God if you will take your calling serious and you're willing to pay the price. God is not a respecter of persons. What he'll do for one, he'll do for all. What's the difference between their lives and our lives? They paid the price. You see, when you get so that it's all God and none of you, all God, not 50-50, well, God, I'm going to keep 50, you keep 50. No, I'll keep 60, and, you know, I'll let you have 40. No, when you yield all the way to God, then God will open all of everything for you, and you will walk in a realm that very few people move in. You can do it. You have to choose. You have to choose. What do you want? Do you want to be just a mediocre Christian and you're content with this level? Or do you want to go to this level? Or do you want to go all the way? If you want to go all the way, it means you've got to give up all. all. And he gives you power and love and a sound mind. What is the sound mind that you have? You have the mind of Christ. You need to put on the mind of Christ. We share that in one of the sessions that you must renew your mind by the washing of the word, be transformed, as we said in Romans chapter 12. So we, as we get in the word and we spend time in the word, uh, I love Pastor Yeager. When I first met Pastor Yeager, he was quoting entire. He still has it in him. And I remember, how do you do that? How do you do that? I'm still, I still wondering, how do you do that? But anyway, and I remember preaching in a church, and uh, Pastor Jerry Began got me in a church in... Um, Waterford, Maine. And these parents, these parents of this little girl, it was a Baptist church, I remember that, because I had to cast a bunch of devils out of everybody. Oh, wait, that didn't come out right. There was a lady that came in with a bunch of devils in her, and I had to cast them out. And because the church wasn't used to seeing that, they were a little scared of me. Okay, I, and... Um, so the Baptist pastor was such a sweetheart, he said to me, how did you do that? How did you cast the devils out of that lady in our church? I said, well, you told me I couldn't teach on that. He goes, no, 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 I'm telling you right now. How did you cast the devil out of that lady that came into the church? It wasn't one of his members. I was in the middle of preaching, and she came running in the back door, double doors, ran in, came up, and was trying to kill me. <laughs> well, I, I couldn't say, excuse me. I can't move in the gifts right now. I'm being choked to death. So I just did deliverance. And so when I got back to the pastor's house, he said, how did you do that? And I said, well, it was the power of the Holy Spirit. And he said to me, I want it. How do I get it? I said, well, you remember what you kind of told me not to talk about? And he goes, yeah. I said, that's how you get it. He goes, you mean the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the praying in tongues and all that stuff? And I went, yep. He goes, I don't care. If it will change lives like that, I want it. Hallelujah. Are you hearing me? Amen. And then he said to me, he says, watch, I want to be all that God wants me to be. And we're training our daughter to be that way. She's two. Now watch, she's two years old. And he said to his little girl, the next day he showed me because it was too late that night. She was asleep. He says to his little girl, come here. He said, tell her Psalm such and such. She's two. She's sitting there quoting word for word this long Psalms. Then he says, now tell her this scripture. And here she comes word for word, just like you do, Pastor Yeager. But she's two. And I'm sitting there going like, well, you don't even know how to read. I mean, she don't even know how to read yet. I said, how can this be? He says, before she was even born, when my wife was pregnant, are you listening? He said, we put the word of God continually, and I had, had a, a speaker by my, my wife's stomach. He said, and from the day the baby's been born, we've had the word of God going continually in her room every night. 
that little girl is going to be a powerhouse for God. A powerhouse. And she, and then I've seen other little girls that were so cute. They were so cute. I watched this. It was just hilarious. At another pastor's house I stayed at, they were playing with their dolls. It was so cute. And um, it was a brother and a sister, actually. And the, the little brother goes, he has his little cardboard box, and he's preaching. And you'll be saved, and he's preaching. He's like four or five, and the little girl says, oh, I my turn, my turn. And she gets up there and goes, the Holy Ghost is on you. The Holy Ghost is on you. She picks up her dolls, and she goes, be healed in the name of Jesus. She dropped the doll so it could fall out under the power of God. <laughs> I mean, that's how the children were playing. To them, it was like, knock the doll down. There she is. She's under the power of God. You pray for this one. Knock the doll down and knock the doll down. And it was like cute. It was so cute because that's all they'd been around. So we must walk in the power, and we have the mind of Christ. It says that you walk in power and love, and you have the mind, a sound mind, a sound mind. That means you fill your mind up with the scriptures. Fill yourself up with the word. Fill yourself up with the power. Fill yourself up by praying in the Holy Ghost. Fill yourself up. Don't be content with where you are. Why does God want you to do that? So you can do what it says in verse 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor me, his prisoner, but share with me in the suffering. Oh, my God, what is that word doing there? Is that right? Is that word suffering? Well, it says, share with me in the suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his purpose and grace, with which he gave us in Christ Jesus before time began. So you've been accepted in the beloved through the blood of Jesus. And he wants us to know that if you're going to go forward, you're going to be sometimes beat up. So put on your armor. Don't forget to put on your armor. Don't forget to start your day. Because the enemy's out there. He's a creep. Because you're in a war. Look what it says in 2 Timothy 2.1. You, therefore, my sons and daughters, be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. And commit these things that you have heard from me among many witnesses commit these to faithful men which means men and women who are able to teach others you have now been to the school of ministry is that not true you have been to the school of ministry some of you've caught the whole school and others have caught part of the school but you have been to the school of ministry so once you learn then it's your turn to teach once you learn something then you share it then you now are to get more mature. And once you've been to these schools, go home, talk to your pastor, make sure you ask your pastor's permission, and say, hey, pastor, what can I do to get involved in the church? I want every one of you that has been students that have come to go home and submit yourself to your pastor and say to your pastor, remember how I said you get started in ministry? I got started cleaning the toilet bowls and having rubber gloves because nobody in the church wanted to do it. So I want you students that have been coming to go home and say, Pastor, it was wonderful at that school in Pennsylvania. And they said, I learned all kinds of things. And one of the things I learned is if I want to be the greatest, to be a servant. So what can I do? What is in the church that nobody else wants to do? Because I will do it. Your pastor's going to be impressed. He might tell you, here's the rubber gloves, go clean the toilet bowl. And if that's where you're going to start, then you start by cleaning the toilet bowls. Okay? And God will see it. And as you're faithful in small things, yes, Nancy, you're going to do really good. I saw you with the rubber gloves. Okay? And I also saw somebody else the other day with big rubber gloves on, so I figured you were cleaning the bathrooms too. And so great will be your reward. Do not despise the day of small beginnings. So it goes on in verse 3. You, verse 3, 2 Timothy 2, 3. You must endure hardship. Oh, my God, that's another word. Must endure hardship. I thought when I got saved and I got started in ministry at Word of Faith, it was so neat. Because all the ladies in the church would go, oh, Sister Joan, what a glamorous job you have. 
you get to just go travel all around the world and be wined and dined by everybody. I said, well, why don't you come along with me and get wined and dined? <laughs> and after they come on the road with me a week or two, they go, this is really hard. I said, yep. Just try to pray for five or six hours and see if the devil doesn't try to beat you up sideways and around the corner. When you're on the, on the ministry field, you're praying for everybody that comes to the meetings. You're doing warfare for everybody that's going to attend. And the devil doesn't like it. You must, you must endure hardship as a good soldier for Christ Jesus. No one engaging in warfare entangles himself in the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. So did the Lord call you into the army? I love, I love the way God recruits people into his army. I mean, they don't have signs out, Navy, Army, Marines, Coast Guard. Come now. We'll show you all the benefits that you can get from joining the military. No, nope. this is how God recruits them. I love it. He goes to the enemy's camp. He goes to the enemy's camp. And he gets them out of the enemy's camp and puts them in his army. You've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness, and then he puts you right over here in the kingdom of God, and then immediately you're in his army. Isn't that amazing? And then you have to go through boot camp training. Now, people don't like going through boot camp training in the military. Okay? You know what? Some people tell me, I mean, I don't know. I've never been in the service, but I hear that they don't let you sleep till 9. <laughs> they make you get up at what time? 4, four in the morning. Now, they don't have to wake you up at 4 in the morning. They could let you sleep till 9. But they do it because they're teaching you discipline. They're teaching you total obedience. They want you to be so obedient that when they say jump, you say how high. They want you totally obedient. And then they don't make you go on these little one-mile walks. They take you and torture you. Now, are they just torturing you because they want to torture you? They want to totally exhaust you? They want to put big pack backs on you and make you jump through this and go under this and climb this and go over this and go through swamps and get on your belly and do this and all that stuff they make you do. Well, well, you're saying, why do I have to do this? Because one day you're going to have to do it. One day you might have to pull yourself through the swamps. One day you might have to climb over this and you can't be no weaklings. I mean, can you imagine if you were a winkling and you're out on the front lines and you're in the trenches and you've got your buddy that's your best friend and you're trying to get from this trench to that trench because the, the commander says, come on, let's go. We're going to run. Go, 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 go. So you're all going across to get to those other trenches and poof, there goes your friend in the leg. And you can't just leave your friend there. So you go over there and you grab them and you put them on your shoulder and you're trying to get away because they're shooting at you. You can't say, you know what, you're my best friend, but you know what, I'm pooped. I am really tired. I'm just going to have to leave you here. Bye. Why does he, they buffet you? Why do they make you exercise, 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 exercise so that you will be strong enough that when somebody else gets hurt, you wimp, won't wimp out. You'll have the muscle power you need to endure the fight and drag your friend across and get a medal of honor. We have war. We're in the war zone. God wants us strong in the spirit so that if somebody else is dealing with demons and having problems, that we are strong enough for our faith, their faith, and their family's faith so they can be set free. And that's not going to happen if we don't get built up in the things of God, built up in the spirit, and built up in the word. And have faith like David. You uncircumcised Philistine. 
How dare you? <laughs> yeah. That we don't back down when somebody says, I don't want you talking about Jesus. Really? One pastor said to us, well, Sister Joan, I'm not sure about where we're putting the tent at for our tent meeting. I said, why? He said, well, they kind of have, kind of have, drive-by shooting in this area. So why don't we put it in the more affluent side of town where all the wealthy people live? And I said, well, that'd be good, but... Do all the wealthy people have cars? And the pastor said, yeah. I said, do all the homeless people have cars? No. I said, so then how is all these people that live in this area that are painfully hurting and their families that have kids that are on drugs and all these people that are wounded and hurting going to get across town to the very nice area? He said, well, they probably won't come. I said, but if we have it here, will they come? He goes, maybe. I said, well, don't tell them there's drive-by shootings. He goes, well, that wouldn't be honest. I said, well, we don't have to put fear in them, do we? We can pray and believe. And so we, we found a, another place. He didn't want that area. Okay, so we moved a few blocks this way, you know. But we still stayed in that area because we have to go where the hurting are. And we cannot bow down to fear. If we bow down to fear, we'll never be effective for anything. God said he didn't give you the spirit of fear. You're going to go into countries and territories where, where you better go because you know that you know that you know you don't need to be in fear because you have these giant angels. I remember seeing my angels. I have two angels. I know I have two. But I know I have more than two. I do know it. Because God let me see. And I just know. And, but I have these two angels. And they're huge. They're really huge. They're like 13, 14 feet tall. And the first time I saw them, I saw them. The only way I can explain it is Star, Star Trek. Beam me up, Spotty, or whatever that is. Huh? Scotty. Well, Scotty, beam me up, Scotty, whatever. <laughs> and so as they're being beamed up, they're kind of shrish, they kind of like, you can see through them, yeah. but they're kind of like this. And when I saw those two angels, I just, because I was raised Catholic, I was still a new Christian when I saw these angels. And I was always taught that angels come when you die to take you. You know, if you see angels, you're dying. They're taking you. So when they appeared and I saw them, I screamed at them. Now, you know what? I'm telling you the truth. You all say, well, if I saw an angel, I would be this way or that way. I know Pastor Yeager's had some beautiful experiences. I'm sure many of you have had very beautiful experiences. And you always think if it happened to you, you're going to react like, oh, wow, I'm in the presence of, of angelic beings. And you're just going to think you're going to, and it's not that way. It's just not. It's like, ah! oh, go away, go away, go away, go away. I don't know what you want to get. Mm -hmm. And then I'm up the side of the road. <gasps> and then after you do all of that, you go, oh, God, I told them to go away. I wonder what they were going to say. I got so fearful that I... No, I know they didn't go away. Huh. You're both still here. You see, a lot of times when I pray... When I do miracle services, I didn't pray that tonight, but I'll say it right now. I say this, and you've, many of you that have been in my services heard me. Father, I say, turn me over to the Holy Spirit. I'll do exactly what you want me to do, Holy Spirit. Jesus, I thank you that you're in the midst. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. So thank you, Jesus, that you are our very most invited guest, that all that happens in this service, all glory and all honor go to you, Almighty God. Then I say, you angels do what you're supposed to do, and I'll do what the Holy Spirit tells me to do. 
and they assist me. I'm serious. They assist me. And they assist you. So we don't need to walk in fear. I can tell you stories where people have tried to shoot me, cut me, hit me, you name it. They've all tried to do it. Would you look at me other than being heavy? A little on the heavy side. I asked the doctor one time, do I have something wrong with me? That's when I went to the doctor. I said, there has to be something not working in me. Like, do I have something overactive or underactive and or whatever, why? And so when the doctor ran some tests on me, he did. He got me back in the office. He says, yes, you do. You have a serious problem. I said, I knew it. That's why I don't lose weight. And he said, you have an overactive fork. <laughs> so that's my only problem. So that's it. Spoke truth. And you shall know the truth, and you should lose some weight. But anyway, so you, ha you don't need to walk in fear because you're in the military. And God wants you to buffet your body. Then go over with me to verse 15. It says, I'm still in 2 Timothy 2, 2, 15. Be diligent to present yourselves approved of God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, in a military force, they aren't going to say, here's the keys to, the, to this jet. Here's a, key, here's a machine gun. Here, use it. Why do you think they have boot camp training? They're going to teach you how to fly that jet. It's a $2 million or a $3 million or, or maybe even in the billion dollars jet. They aren't going to just give you the keys and go, oh, like, let's see. They're going to make you study and learn how to be equipped and use the tools. So the Bible says here, study to show yourself approved. A workman that does not need to be ashamed. So therefore, you should learn all the salvation messages, salvation scriptures, so you know how to lead people to the Lord. Yes, yeah, sharing your testimony is great, but you need to know certain scriptures that will help people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. Then you should have scriptures that you can show somebody how to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And you can go through all the scriptures on how to lead people to the baptism. Then you can have scriptures on healing and scriptures on deliverance and scriptures on why you shouldn't be in witchcraft. And now we need to know there's a good scripture about men having sex with men and women having sex with women. It's there. It's in the Bible what God thinks about it. And you have to be able to share this in love, not in condemnation. I'll never forget doing something in the park in Kennewick. And these two guys were walking away. I knew in my spirit that they were living together. But I went up and started witnessing to them anyway. And I started telling them that God loved them. And they said, well, not according to that guy on television. He said, we should all die of AIDS. I said, I don't think you should die of AIDS. And they both looked at me and said, you don't? I said, no, I think, no, you shouldn't die of AIDS. Well, don't you think we're the worst sinner in the world? Don't you know what we are? And I says, yeah, I kind of got the idea. <laughs> he said, well, don't you know what we are? Don't you think, like all those other preachers, that we're the worst people in the world? I said, no. Sin is sin. Is sin sin? Amen. I said, well, I don't see where you're sinning any worse than the lady that talks about her pastor all the time in church. Yeah. What does the Bible say? The seven things God hates is he that causes discord amongst the brethren. Some people can destroy a whole church with their tongue. I said, it's not the matter of your sin, what you're doing. I addressed it that it is sin. Not that I was born this way. It's not that that's keeping you from God. It's the choices we made. I said, it doesn't matter. Jesus came to save all have sinned and all have missed it. So all God wants is us to recognize change our life and come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. So the one guy looked at the other guy and says, Joe, maybe we should pray and ask Jesus into our heart. And he goes, 
Are you kidding? Don't you realize that if you pray, at least he had sense. He says, don't you realize if we pray with her and we ask Jesus in our heart that we got to go our separate ways and we can't keep doing what we're doing? At least he acknowledged it. Well, then he said, come on, stop listening to this lady tell you all about Jesus. And I hand him that little book, the little yellow book, The Empty Spot, which is on the book table. I said, here, just take time to read this. It just tells you how much Jesus loves you. And about a week or two later, it came in the mail. The end of it has a little thing you rip out. It says, it said, hi, I'm the guy in the, I'm the, guy in the park that wanted to pray with you. If you can call me, I want to know more about Jesus. I called the phone number he left. He says, you know, he said, I'm living a gay lifestyle. And I went, yeah, I know that. He says, can you meet with me in a public place so we can talk? And so I took a friend, because you, know, you always do things in teams. I took a friend. He accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior and says, I really need to get my heart right with God. I'm dying of AIDS, and I don't want to die. I said, you won't die. You won't die. And he never did die. I mean, he might die now. I don't know. He's going to get old. But anyway, he'll die natural death, but he's not dying of AIDS. Just like when we were in Trinidad, these two lovely ladies were with us in Trinidad. Trinidad and a, and a young man came, and he had um, a, a young daughter that was about three, three years old, and a, an 18, 19-year-old wife, and he was, what, 20, 21, 22? And he came, he got saved, he got filled with the Holy Spirit, and the last night the whole team prayed because he had, he had AIDS. The whole team prayed for him. He went back to the doctor, no trace of AIDS. You see, there's no problems for God, but we have to be in the army of God. And how do we, what are some of our tools? Study to show yourself approved. I don't believe in condemning people into Christ. Does that make sense? I don't believe, I don't believe, I know there's some people out there that, that want to show you that you're a sinner. Or you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner. You know what? People already know they're sinners. They need to know that there's a God that loves they need to know there's a God that loves, but then they have to know that if they ask Jesus into their heart, this is part of preaching the gospel, that if they ask Jesus into their heart, and they're going to pray and ask Jesus into their heart, that means if you're living together, if you make this commitment to the Lord, are you going to say that you will separate and not live together no more? Yes. Then let's pray. Then I go, now one of you has to sleep on the couch, and the other one's going to go find someplace else to sleep. Because if you really mean it, you're going to quit sinning. You're going to turn around. So we have to study. So we need to study so that we rightfully can answer each person. So if we're going to be in the military of God and in the things of God, and we have to consider it that we cannot just get out there and say, well, someday I'm going to learn how to lead people to the Lord. Well, someday I'm going to learn somebody, how to lead somebody to the bat. Oh, someday I'm going to learn how to cast that devil. Study and get the word of God in you. Get yourself a book and start writing down scriptures. I tell people to get their Bible and write in the back how to witness salvation. And then they put salvation scriptures and have it all in your, if you don't know them right at the beginning, just, just look it up and it's right there in your Bible. And then as you get, so you quote them, then you get so you know them and you know they're here, 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 bang, 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 bang. Do I know the whole Bible? Huh. Are you kidding? Do I know where all the salvation scriptures are? Oh, yeah. Do I know where all the scriptures for the baptism? Oh, yeah. Do I know where all the scriptures for healing are? Oh, huh. yep. Deliverance, yep. Witches, yep. Because I've got this whole little library. Do I know the Old Testament very much? Uh-uh. Do I have all of Revelations? No. Nope. Why? Because I'm not going to get anybody saved by teaching them out of Revelations. Do I know scriptures on giving? Yep but I'm not going to use it out there. I don't need to teach people how to give. Let's get them saved first before we get their money. Do I want to teach them on giving? Yes. Do I want to teach them so I can get their money? No. I want them to learn to give so they can get out of poverty because if they never give, they'll never get out of poverty. A lot of times at the tent meetings, the Holy Spirit will have me do stuff like this. Go to the bank before I do the last day of the tent meeting when all the unsaved come. They're all coming to get free groceries. They're coming to get watermelons. They're coming to get cantaloupes. They're coming to get groceries and food and pots and pans. And I give them all money. 
Before I do the offering, I go hand them all so much money. I say, now you have a choice. You can keep the money. I only give them a couple bucks. But it's a principle. You can keep the money and stay in poverty and stay homeless. Or you can sow into the kingdom and be set free. Because I believe. I believe with all my heart in the principle of giving. I believe. And Marty and I know that when we give, that God will take care of us. I don't give to get. Are you hearing? I give because I see a need. I give when I see somebody else hurting. I do unto others as I would want them to do. So I give and give. And God, in, in turn, sees my heart and he opens his hands. And I don't always get it in money, but I'll get it in things. I have a gift on me, and I'm telling you, there is a gift that is on me that God has put on me. Maybe it was when I gave up that whole business. Because for me to give away that business where I made $105,000 a year, and that was 27 or 28 years ago, that was pretty good money. It's still a lot of money today. A new house, a big house on the golf course, a new car every year. It doesn't matter. See, I know what it's like to be poor. I know what it's like to steal food to eat. I know what it's like to live on the streets. I know what it's like to try to raise three children on welfare and food stamps and not enough of anything. I know what it's like for my kids to not even have a Christmas. I didn't even let them know Christmas came and Christmas went. They were so little they didn't know, but I didn't have no money anyway. I know what it's like. And then I know what it's like to be wealthy and go on the cruises and here and there. And really, I liked it better when I was poor, to be honest with you. Because things can't make you happy. And I gave it all away so I could be what I am. And I'm totally content. And because of it, I guess, God just keeps blessing me and blessing me and blessing Marty and blessing our family. Is it easy all the time? No. And sometimes when I'm the brokest, the Lord will say, give. And sometimes I'll just do something like take a ring or a bracelet or something because I have no money left, and I'll just give a piece of jewelry. I'll give something, whether it's my best outfit. Like Marty asked me not too long ago, what happened to that really pretty dress that I bought you? He bought me this dress. It was 250 It was, you know, really expensive dress. And he said, where is that dress? I said, well... There was this evangelist, and she was about the same size as me, and she kept liking the dress. And she's a singer, and she sings so good, and she's getting ready to cut an album. And I just thought the dress would look so cool on her. He said, but I got that for you. I said, yeah, I know, but you gave it to me so I can do what I want with it. Yeah. And he says, yeah, honey, you know me. No, you don't have to worry. My husband said, you know me. You could give away every piece of clothes in your closet. He said, if God tells you to do it, you just do it. You know, when I first met him, I couldn't understand him. I mean, we'd been married like a few months. And he, we went into a gas station, and he said, look at these shoes. And I said, yeah, nice. And he goes, yeah. He said, look at them. He said, and he knows all this stuff. Me, I have no idea. He knows brands. He knows brands. I know one brand. Is it cheap enough? You know, I know that sounds crazy, but he knows all these name brands. He goes, this is such and such, such and such type, type shoe. And I go, whatever. He goes, look, he says, they're only 19 I went, yeah. I said, 19 sounds about right for shoes. He goes, not for this kind of shoe. So I said, well, buy it then. So he comes out to the truck, and he's got like four or five bags. I go, what? He goes, well, honey. He said, when we find people that don't have shoes, I, we can, he said, you never buy one. You always buy two or three or four or five or six or 10 or 20. Anyway, he, he get, and so, he, so then he just, he buys things with things in mind I can bless. He, he thinks always, who can I bless? Who can I bless? I mean, he's just that way. And I, I mean, now he's rubbed off on me and I'm rubbing off on him. And um, boy. I was already a giver, and now he's like stretching me to a whole other realm of giving. But it's okay. It's okay. But it's like all this that God wants you to do. Verse 19. It says in verse 19. 
Nevertheless, the solid foundations, foundation of God stands. Having this seal. Do you believe you should have a solid foundation? If your foundation of a house is not solid and it's crooked, it might look all right while the building's going up, but sooner or later it's going to topple over. So as you start building your ministry, make sure you have a solid foundation on Christ Jesus the rock. Nevertheless, a solid foundation stands, of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So if you call yourself a Christian, there should not be sin in you. Are you hearing me? If you call yourself a Christian, that means you aren't sinning anymore. The Bible says, be ye holy as I'm holy. A lot of people say, well, you never really can get all the way holy. You can't really be holy, can you, Joan? I go, well, God said, be ye holy as I'm holy, so evidently, yes. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. How many of you want to be a vessel of honor? It's like when you have your muscles build up and the guy gets shot on the side of the, uh, where you're trying to go across and you grab that guy and you get out there and you drag him to safety, you get a, a, a medal of honor, right? If you save somebody and you use some heroic deed that protects somebody, helps somebody, the military will give you some kind of a medal. Well, how about this? You can be a, me a vessel of honor or a vessel of dishonor. And if you do something in the military that is not according to what they, how they expect you to live and be, they give you a dishonorable discharge. So then God is saying to us, our lives should live so we honor God. Our lives should be so our life honors God and that we don't get dishonorable discharge because we're doing sin and one day they see you in the pulpit, and one day they see you leading somebody to the Lord, and the next day they see you down at Joe Blow's bar. You can't live both worlds. Choosy this day. Put a, put a, put a stick and make a, make a, a mark in the sand and say, I'm not going to, I'm going to step over into a realm of God, and I'm not going back. I've decided to follow Jesus. As for me and my house, as Joshua said, we will serve the Lord. That's what God wants. That's what God wants. He wants you to be a, a vessel of honor. And it says, therefore, if any cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. And God wants us to be prepared for every good work. And he tells us how we should live our life and how we should witness. Verse 23. It says, avoid foolish and arrogant disputes, knowing they gender strife. For the servant of the Lord must not quarrel but be gentle to all, able to teach in patience, in humility correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been led captive by him to do his will. You see, the whole world, a whole bunch of people in the world are just bound by the devil. They're doing things because the devil has saying, do that, cheat, steal, do drugs, whatever. They're bound. And a servant of the Lord needs to have the goods to go set them free. God wants you and I to study, to be prayed up, to learn the ministry, go out and set the captives free. That's what God wants. Because we know that in the last days it'll be perilous times. We know that things are getting worse and worse, and you can read chapter 3 later. But I want you to go to 3.16. It says, 
All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be completely, not partially, not the first video, the second video, in the perfect will of God, that the man of God may be completely, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's what this whole school of ministry is, equipping the saints to do the work that God's called you to do. Verse, chapter 4, verse 1. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearance and in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convict, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrines, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ear away from the truth and be turned aside by fables. But you be watchful in all these things, Endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. Paul says to young Timothy, Paul is saying, And I, for I am ready, for I am ready being poured out. Paul is saying, I'm being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure is at hand. The time of my departure is at hand. Paul says this. He says just before he died, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And finally there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not to me alone, but also to those who have loved his appearance. And so what I'm saying in conclusion of this school of ministry is finish your course finish your course because there's laid up a crown waiting for you and as Paul finished writing the book shortly after they led him outside and he ended up I'm not sure how they did it but they probably put his head in some kind of thing and then it went and he was in the presence of the Lord. He had finished his course. One day we'll all leave planet Earth. One day. No matter what. It's appointed for everyone to be born. It's appointed for everyone to die. But while we're here on Earth, we're passing through. And you can't take anything into heaven. Naked you came into the world. Naked you'll go out. But what you've done for Christ while you were on the Earth is what you'll offer to your king of kings and say, this is what my life represented. The souls that were saved, the lives will be changed. And he will say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter the joy of the Lord. And isn't that what we all want? We want to please our commander in chief, our God almighty, and glorify God with what we do while we're here on earth. I want to thank you all for coming to the school. And right now, what I want to do is I want to pray for every one of you that you will find your gifts and calling and walk in the anointing that God wants you to walk in. I want you to be free to walk in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit.